My name is Karen Fogarty and I am an artist. I've been an artist my whole life. I'm represented by Rosenfeld Gallery. A little bit of my history is that I started at Moore College of Art about a hundred years ago and then I was lucky enough to spend some time at the Pennsylvania Academy which were wonderful, creative, supportive years and they gave me the confidence that I needed to continue to work and continue to move on with what I do. But the Academy really opened my eyes and gave me the chance to interact with artists of stature. Oliver Grimley was a huge influence. He gave me discipline. He told me that this was going to be work and that work had to be done. The idea that you don't always go into the studio thinking how wonderful everything is going to be. Sometimes it's a real job, but you keep going and you keep working and you keep moving forward. I also got from him the idea that there were tools for our trade, proportion and placement and value structure that I could rely on, real, real compositional tools. Liz Osborne gave me wings. She was a terrific influence. She took what I was grounded in and made me take off from there, see possibilities beyond what was just in front of me. Today, I'm both a teacher and an artist, and I'm enjoying an opening here, my third opening with Richard. The intent that I have is to walk a line between abstraction and objectivity. I don't want to go to pure abstraction. I'd like to stay a little close to the object, but I would like you, the viewer, to feel that it fluctuates between the two. I'm interested in an elusive quality. The spaces are rather mundane, maybe just a staircase or perhaps a door that's open, I left behind a couple of coats, but to me, it speaks about life that's gone on in those spaces over a period of time and the energy that was left behind. In terms of the world of art, Edwin Dickinson is a tremendous influence. I loved the dreamlike fugue state that he would always be able to capture in his paintings. I aim for that. I don't know that I'm always that successful. Looking at the tonality and the brushwork and the sense of space in them, there is a remarkable link to analytic cubism. Are you a fan of cubism? I am a fan of cubism and I spent a good deal of time in the Philadelphia Art Museum pondering and trying to understand those concepts. Not just the fact that the paintings work, the paintings work, but the concept behind it. One of the things that you may say that I, I borrowed from that is edge quality. I think that edge quality is tremendously important to me. A softer edge versus a harder edge and the way that a harder edge can really stop your eye. The brush seemed a little too soft. The palette knife was a little too hard. And eventually I made my own painting tool. I took matte board, cut strips of it, and made what amounted to a soft palette knife. So it puts the paint on, but it also pulls the paint in a way that I can obscure edges, soften, and I never forget my fingers, which are always knee deep in it. 
but generally the soft palette knife has given me that look where it's sort of hard edged, but not really. If you have a good strong value structure, the painting will come to fruition. But edge quality, it's an elusive thing, but it's a wonderful addition to that arrangement of values. When non-artists talk about value structures, it means teenagers can't have sex. <laughs> what, what do you mean by value structure? You're right, I'm sorry. By value structure, I mean the range of light and dark within the picture plane going from the lightest light to the darkest dark. For example, in my drawings, my value structure went from the lightest possible light that I could get, practically working my way through the paper to get to the light, and the darkest dark that I could get. When I change mediums uh, and go to oil, the addition of the color seems to, in me, evoke a response where the darks were not quite as dark. And that's where the atmospheric quality came in. Color filled that gap between a wide value range and a narrower one to allow room for color to exist. Years ago, I also significantly limited my palette. I came to the understanding, as, as I teach color, that I wanted to go down to the fewest amount of ingredients, but get the most out of them. So I cut myself back to what is essentially a primary palette that has six colors, a warm and a cool yellow, a warm and a cool red, a warm and a cool blue. And that gives me a great deal of range. So while my paintings may appear to be very monochromatic, they are hardly, if you look closer, you're going to see subtle shifts that always, I hope, vibrate. Most of the vibration is temperature oriented, a little warmer, a little cooler, which makes it vibrate, I think, to my eye. I began to teach about 12 years ago. I was asked to teach a drawing class at the Wayne Art Center, which I thought would really be a challenge. And I thought it would help me also as an artist because it would mean I'd have to articulate to others some of the things that were going on in my head. And in doing so, perhaps understand them better myself. I began with one class about 12 years ago, and now I teach seven classes a week. I teach drawing and figure drawing and oil painting. I have wonderful students. They're all adults. They range in age from 20 to 80. The great commonality is that they all love art, and you come into that room and where you might have generational divides that people would never spend any time talking to one another, you have a wonderful camaraderie. It passes over gender, it passes over money, it passes over age. It's the great common denominator and that's what I love about it.